Tech Cocktail Sessions, educational and inspirational talks from experienced startup founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly. It's usually a longer talk, but I, I, I'm very grateful to be here because it's been a huge pain in the neck for us to find time and get to uh, Las Vegas and uh, uh, pull this off. So I, I appreciate your patience in doing that. And, um, but I'll just tell, take you through a quick journey of some learning that I had to go through in development of uh, building companies and, um, and some of the kind of hard lessons. But very briefly, just as a quick background, been doing uh, startups for now for 20 years. I've had four startups, had kind of a small, medium, and large exit IPO. I've, I've had soul-crushing failure and raised a boatload of venture capital along, along the ways uh, and had a great time in doing that. Dad out three little kids, uh, Jack, Stephen, and Lucas, and do a lot of angel investing in New York and East Coast and West Coast, about uh, 30 deals and a little fund I have called Opt Option Return, involved with Venture America and Smithsonian and others. Um, so part of what you realize, and this is kind of a famous quote, so for the VCs in the room, you'll have heard some of this before, but hopefully something, maybe one or two original uh, learnings uh, from this talk. But uh, the journey of building companies, as Elon says, is like uh, eating glass. And it starts off fantastic. We launch, we build, we raise capital, we get early, uh, early success, and then we go through chapters, long chapters of grinding failure. And uh, it, it suddenly you realize that it's the, the job of building a, a business is basically uh, to become undead, in a way, statistically even. So it, it's, uh, you're sort of a failure until you're not. And so the glamour of, of building businesses sort of fades away as you really learn uh, how to build a business. And so in the bottom of one of these chapters for me, after doing this for 20 years, I realized that I need to go out and really dig in and figure out how do I relook at my business through new lenses. And so um, I had scaled the business from zero to about a little under 200 employees in about uh, three years. Uh, we were in revenue, growing pretty quickly, but we were sort of in the, in the wrong space. We were in the middle markets. We, didn't, we, didn't, we were big enough to mean enough to a few people, but not big enough to, meet, to mean a lot to the right people. And so I started uh, on my kind of half my life in the West Coast, half, half my life in the uh, uh, East Coast and West Coast. I started doing these interviews with friends and contacts, friends and friends of friends, including Tony and, and others, around asking them basically two fundamental questions. One is, what are the lenses that you view the world through? So what are the lenses that you look and pick your ideas through that the idea has to pass through to, be, uh, to, to actually launch a business, the criteria? And two is what do you do in the first five years not to die? So this turned into a 45 you know, interviews, 300 plus hours. Every time I was in a city, I would, just, I would call up a bunch of uh, friends and sit down with them, videotape, ask them that two questions and let them just talk. It, and we reached from Tony Shea to Elon Musk to Reid Hoffman, who wrote the four of the book, to Ben and Mark at Andreessen uh, uh, Horowitz, um, to Sarah Blakely, of uh, the founder of Spanx, the second self-made billionaire woman in the world, um, sorry, in the US, to Priceline, to nonprofits like TED, and Charity Water, and Acumen Fund, and uh, so amazing people. So what came out of this was these, uh, these lenses, these lenses that were actually the criteria um, by which they made the business form through before it became successful, that also surfaced a bunch of sort of innate instincts that all of them had in common. They're basically all saying the same five things. And it, what this happened, well, how this happened is, is that I started thinking about my own business to reshape through these lenses, but also um, post that business, decided to create something that passed through those lenses innately from the beginning, from day one. And so what I want you to do is that you kind of hear this sort of cheat sheet of the five lenses, because I know we're all like, type A freaks, and you just want the five things very quickly, and you just want to get it done and get it back to work. Um, I'll just tell you what they are, but as you're listening to these, think about your business today, and think if you could start over, um, would you actually bet your life on your business it passed through these lenses, or, actually, and, if your business today doesn't pass through the lenses, what does it have to become to actually go through them? So the first one, which is common across all of them, and these are actually force ranked, was, the, uh, was proprietary gifts. So all the founders um, generated their ideas and their business through innate giftedness. And so what they realized was is that if they could actually um, form the idea from something they could actually be the best in the world at, the probability that if they bet their life over a 10-year period in that business, that they could actually become the best in the world versus the competitive landscape. And very often, companies are sort of chasing white space. But they were operating from a place of innate giftedness and that was just unfair. They were, play, they were operating from a place of skill and education and uh, birthright in some cases to actually go and build something that no one else could do. And so to do this really well, you have to have a very unbiased view of your giftedness. 
at this stage of starting a company, we're sort of, you have to be sort of done fixing yourself. We have to be at a place where we're quitting weaknesses and we're going, tripling down on the things that were giftedness. And to do this, you have to have a very objective view of your gifts. And we all have fantasies that we're going to be you know, a pro athlete and we're going to make it to the pros or we're going to be you know, a famous actor or actress. But you know, obviously, we all have rock, dreams of rock stars. We're in Vegas. But we have to be willing to accept that whatever we do do, we have to be literally the smartest person in the world. We don't want to put ourselves in stages where this is improbable or probably in most cases not possible. So I guess the, the lens here is, is to seek the unfair advantage. As the founders of these companies, what exactly is the unfair advantage this lens that your company is, um, um, as an eight gift is actually playing uh, with? And I think the ideas very often have to be embedded in this truth to actually get the traction that you want. Number two is, is how do you gain extreme focus into a single big idea? Uh, this comes from Reid Hoffman. And it, because it takes so much patience to actually build these companies, the extreme focus lens, um, if you borrow some of the kind of philosophies and methodologies like Lean Star Brothers, they allow you to test a lot of ideas inexpensively and cheaply. They help you get this, but very early, or I say early in the life of a company, the average company life is about six to eight years just to get it kind of into a scaled position. So say the first couple of years, 24 to 36 months, it has to gain to extreme focus with confidence into the one thing it could be in the world. So our fight is to actually get this, is to get extreme focus. It's so hard to get traction and economic oxygen in the business, but you have to apply all that force, all the bodies, all the attention. It's like driving a nail into a marketplace. You need all that force in a single place to pull it off. And so when you're diluting your attention across too many features or too many options or, or too many uh, partnerships or too many versions of the company, we're just going to literally run out of time and money to actually get anyone that's going to produce the truth. And so concentrating your focus into a single place and making sure it's the right one is a very critical uh, part of this. Uh, optionalities are really your enemy um, as companies kind of cross those chasms. I think it was Jeffrey Moore who wrote that book. Um, so what you, what you need to do this as the instinct here is just set yourself up to embrace patience. It, you always hear the stories um, and you live this out when you raise capital. It takes you know, two or three times as long and two or three times as much capital. And that's all about just, the, just the, the cohorts of time and energy and money and testing and, and learning velocity. But you have to be able to be in a position to create patience so that you can get that at focus. And when you don't have patience, you overspend or you don't test enough ideas with the right level of economics, you literally run out of time and they typically these ideas drive over a cliff. So again, second lens is around extreme focus. The third lens is a very common uh, uh, kind of phrase that VCs like to say, is to build painkillers and not vitamins. And while this seems sort of like a, a, a simple idea, it turns out to be one that's pretty hard uh, to do. Uh, vitamins are things that we're very passionate about. Uh, they're elective. Okay, so if I, uh, you know, a little show of hands, and these lights are like, you know, about, uh, you know, a megawatt of power here. Um, like, how many people took vitamins today? Just quick show of hands. So you guys are very healthy out here. I mean, that's, a, that's a, an unusually large group. Usually it's you know, 10, 20% of the audience. Um, it's really something that if your intent is to take care of yourself, if your intent is to eat healthy, it's something you can do, but you, can't li you can live without. Painkillers are something that deal with chronic, malignant, growing, inflamed um, uh, problems that businesses or consumers have that we can solve for. We can get ourselves into the life of a customer and be there with permanence. We have um, opportunity to stay with them forever because we actually are solving a pain. And so if our idea doesn't uh, solve a pain for a customer, it's not passing through a painkiller lens, we have to determine what is it about our business that actually solves pain for customers. And I like to use the phrase, it's better to work with rich and in pain customers than poor than in pain. Uh, it turns out rich and in pain create more economic oxygen for you, more permanence, you stick around longer, and you can solve uh, bigger problems for them that mean more. Uh, create more value. The instinct is very simple, is to make sure your, your, your customer, your, your, your product or your offering is, is solving this chronic pain test. One of the things that we've uh, been uh, learning at Bionic in the last uh, you know, year and a half is the shift in understanding the pain is really, um, well, there's this sort of like total addressable market type thinking that you learn uh, in business school. I did not go to business school, but for those of you who did, um, it's, a very, uh, uh, it's, it's a very good um, understanding of marketplace that exists today. Um, so it's sort of like uh, if you're going big to bigger like you would be doing if you're an existing company, you would sort of use total addressable marketing to, uh, market to, to kind of understand what exists in a marketplace that you can take advantage of. 
part of our obsession as entrepreneurs is to move from just what exists today to what is the total addressable problem that we can solve for, the total addressable pain. And that shift is sort of like matter and dark matter in marketplaces. Matter exists, it exists in revenue, exists in offering that we can go compete and take share from, but that often is an incremental outcome. If our job in seeking the chronic pain is to understand the total addressable problem that we're trying to solve, it typically means you can redraw a marketplace and dominate it. You don't want two or 3% of every marketplace, you want 99% of it. And through that lens, you can become something that actually matters more, but you have to have the type of lens that reveals what really doesn't exist. And that very often sits in the customer's actions. Not what they tell you, but the way they act. And this is a great lens to look that through. So if you took all of your best ideas in your company today, and you start looking through those lenses, am I you know, playing with unfair advantage? Right? I mean, I'm playing from proprietary giftedness for my company. Number two is, oh, have I gained extreme focus? Have I found over a period of the you know, first two or three years the one you know, big thing that we can be in the marketplace? Are we dealing with a total addressable pain that um, is, um, is something that no one else in the world can actually do? And the third thing is, um, is just be able to build a painkiller and not a vitamin. Are we really uh, looking at this business uh, with honesty and truthfulness that actually shows that you know, this isn't something we wish would happen, but it does happen because we're, it's being pulled out of us. So if your idea passes through those lenses, you get to two of the final ones that are actually even harder. So this comes down to actually the execution. So of the things that you could do that pass through those lenses, you have to do something that can be 10 times better than anybody else in the world. So this is also sort of common lore in the VC world, but if you want to uh, unpack this a little further is when you have uh, time and energy, or in, in many cases, kind of venture capital, it's really about how are you going to pour your time and energy into the resources that lead to an out outcome for the business. So you could spend that money in a lot of different places. But if you can imagine the company being sold for assets, you know, after five, six years of work, the things that you pour their, your time and money into have to be the things that drive this 10x factor. You can't spend asymmet or symmetrically across all the, a the aspects of the business. You have to do the one focus and over-concentrate your resources and time in the things that actually produce the 10x outcome because that's sort of the core pillar of the business. So even if you sold it for, for assets, you got rid of all the revenue uh, considerations and even the talent, that one thing is so valuable that it carries almost the entire value of the company. So this is a very difficult thing to do because now this is subject to talent and focus and all the kind of mechanics of building a business, but this is a skill that says, um, if you can uh, get there over a period of time, you're going to win uh, disproportionately. To do this, again, this is something that Reed shared a lot about, is that you can't be in a marketplace sort of thinking about basis points of share, basis points of differentiation, or features. You have to be thinking as a radical outsider. The radical outsiders really understand the customer problem and build something so utterly unique that it's not sort of benchmarking itself and chasing uh, press releases of the competitive landscape. Those, in, th in those cases, you're typically... Um, you're dealing with a, sort of an incremental outcome, two or three times better than the marketplace if you're very good, but very often it's just very perishable. So we want to seek with a, uh, for a radically differentiated view of the value that we're creating for the customers that lead to us winning. So the last thing is, is and this is something that I didn't realize, so the big learning for me out of uh, this writing this, uh, this book and, and taking this kind of uh, journey through writing the Start Playbook was just the level of monopolistic instinct that the best entrepreneurs had from day one. So it, this sort of sounds like um, uh, sort of maybe overtly aggressive because it is. Our, 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 your intention should be implicitly and explicitly designed into the experience is to basically hook in customers so they can't leave. So I'm taking a very crass view of this, but the point is you gotta create value that's so sticky and so serrated in a way that um, it creates enough runway for you to create value for the customer so that even if they you know, love you and they're willing to pay for your service for a period of time, eventually they're gonna leave their jobs or, or um, um, they're gonna get tired of paying you. They're gonna try to change the dynamic of the relationship. And when they do, you have to be in a place where you have permanence. And so permanence or monopolistic type thinking helps shape what you make, both you know, in what we design in and while we, what, you know, that can all lead all the way to, to the contracts, but it creates the, the psyche in the business that helps you create staying power in the marketplace. It is aggressive, but you know, growth is so stupidly hard and so perishable that you need to be doing this from day one. And this is something I've started to um, adopt in my own business, which is uh, leading to um, uh, a lot of ex uh, exciting kind of evidence that it's actually true. Um, but a lot of startups actually don't do this. They don't think this way. They think that it's a, a pure meritocracy if they're the, you know, the, the uh, you know, and at least in the enterprise space, 
that if they're their most beloved company, that will leave, lead to, um, you know, to, to greater degree of success. This is, I think in some context, since, since Tony's in the audience, this might be the, uh, sort of the opposite view of the world <laughs> that maybe the, you know, the service operating system has, but it is something to consider about how you create permanence and stickiness in your business. Um, what this deals with, I think this is sort of the bottom of the, of the funnel, is really about the truth. Uh, Elon told me uh, when, I was, uh, when he was, this was about four years ago, He's a good friend of ours, Adair Ressi, and he was sort of crossing the chasm, so to speak, with uh, two of his businesses, uh, SpaceX and Tesla at the time. And um, he was just sharing it uh, one evening just about the, you know, that struggle, um, having bet you know, 400 million bucks in a couple of companies. And just that he said that you know, in a very simple sentence that, sentence that wishful thinking is the enemy. And so while he is an incredible optimist, he's not pathologically optimistic. He only wants to deal with the truth. And I think this is good entrepreneurs. The thing that should be keeping you up at night is not you know, there is technology risk and there is execution risk and talent risk, but is, are we really dealing with the truth? Do we really understand uh, through these lenses the type of a role we have in a marketplace that's being rewarded in whatever economic exchange we have for the customer? And if, it's a very simple equation, which is if it's not really true to you as the founder when you put your head in your pillow, because it's not, you haven't validated, you haven't done the work, you haven't designed an organization to get the work, it's really not going to be true to the team and it's not going to be true to the marketplace in that order. It's like, a, it's like an axle, you, the T, the marketplace. And so when we kind of like are intellectually dishonest about the evidence of the business, then everybody knows it. And while someone might be willing to pay for it eventually, you know, at some point, the team ultimately questions uh, the founder's objectivity and unbiasedness in finding the answer and what the business has to become to be successful. So you should really think about this as founders, as am I dealing with the truth? Do I have the mechanisms in place, the people around me, the conversation with the customers, where I'm getting to it that translates to the team and we can actually win. So I want to just talk about, close with these, this last two or three slides because we have limited time. But I want you to think about those lenses, think about how you can become uh, potentially a business that passes through them. Uh, not all of them apply perfectly. Sometimes they're uh, kind of weak signals or strong signals. You have to use your own judgment there. Um, but they are very, um, uh, they're a very strong way to select and to shape your business idea that have led to a, you know, a ton of economic value for investors and some of the founders in the Startup Playbook and others. So I just want to close with these things. This is, um, I'm building a bunch of companies. I already talked about this, which is one of the contexts for the whole business as you're kind of crossing these chasms, as Susan said a minute ago, is to really get the companies into a place to focus um, so they can actually name that moment, name that chasm, because there's always going to be another one on the other side. So the team can know what battle they're in. They can know what fight we're trying to accomplish, and they need context to do that. If you've ever read uh, Seth Godin's The Dip, they're sort of like the dips, right? There's always another one coming, but if the company's concentrated with focus on how they're going to solve that great challenge, you know, everybody will kind of know where they are in the journey, the narrative of where the business is. And they'll also know that there's going to be another one coming after it. Once we solve you know, product market fit, then we're going to solve talent and scale and infrastructure and systems, whatever. There's a whole bunch of them, but we have to have context in this journey so that people uh, can follow us. And as a CEO, you know, now fifth time, it took me a long time to both frame these for people to follow the journey through because I can hold my breath and run for a long time as an entrepreneur. Most of the people who work for you probably can't. They don't have all the knowledge. They're probably not hardwired the same way. They don't have that same level of sort of nuclear drive that you do. So this is a very important skill to develop in, uh, in building these companies. And quite frankly, the answer to the question of like, you know, the should not can, uh, uh, the should not can question, there's a lot of things that you can do with both, of them, uh, both with your funding um, and again, sometimes even limited funding um, and your energies. And the really question you should be asking yourself is should we even do it? Not can we do it, because that's great optionality, but should, and actually create a very high bar that vets and filters, um, uh, filters your thinking. And forcing the company in every context to build from the outside in. We ultimately only care about what is the problem of the customer that we're solving and building it backwards. Our founders bias in a lot of cases are, that's a great energy to get a company launched, and not always the case that actually gets them to scale. So you kind of earn the right to the, uh, the founder's energy to get funded, to get economic oxygen, to start the idea. But what it becomes has to deal with that total addressable problem that needs to be built backwards from the outside in as it shifts from the inside out when it first starts. Um, we, you guys all have probably read Lean Startup. I've led, last uh, um, 18 months, I've been leading a global transformation of GE. There's a story in Bloomberg about it today with Eric Ries and Steve Blank about rewriting the whole operating system for GE. So I spend well, a total disproportionate amount of time with Jeff ML and the team just kind of rewiring the whole company. But this is one of the key things, which is 
around high variation, cheap, failure, uh, cheap failure. You don't want to create a low variation environment where you know, the founder's bias uh, doesn't allow the right risks to be taken in the right places. And so uh, focusing on cheap uh, failure and a lot of inexpensive learning uh, allows you to go chase those dark alleys and come back that gains you, uh, gains you extreme focus. Um, I've got these last three slides. I'm going to skip one here. This is, uh, may surprise you, but maybe not, may not, um, is that revenue discovery takes a very long time. So even though while some companies go out of the box and create a lot of money you know, in the early stages, um, you actually don't know about the torque of those businesses. In many cases, and I've, I've experienced this, which is you'll go out, you'll have a lot of rapid success in your first couple of years, but you're effectively building a company that passed to nowhere. You've aimed it into a marketplace that just has, you basically built a zombie. If you're a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar company on a path to nowhere because you've literally focused that concent and concentrated that energy into a marketplace that has no ability to pull the business forward. And so it's very, you have to be very careful in the beginning of the companies, even if you're experiencing a lot of success, that those economic oxygen uh, signals or that engagement signals are the ones with a whole business behind it, a whole marketplace behind it that's going to be, be able to uh, lift you and pull you forward, in some, very often not even on your own power. So around, about this idea, when I asked uh, all the entrepreneurs at the Startup Playbook, you know, what percentage of your outcome as an entrepreneur was just good fortune, timing, luck, blessings, the for, you know, universe, God, whatever you want to believe, um, they all said about 75%. So as good as we are, right, as hard as we work and as smart as our venture capitalists are behind us and our people, you know, most of the reasons why we've been successful have been things, have they been, you know, forces that have been outside of us, okay? Parts of the marketplace that evolved and we were, we, we, we did our best to time it, but because of the timing, because of the intersection that we bet the company on, we, you know, disproportionately or asymmetrically benefited from that outcome. And so to think about this, it means that typically the business cycle, within three years, you've learned enough about the business to probably not die, but you're on the road to death very often. But you have to identify the things that are outside of your control that could pull the whole marketplace forward. We've seen this happen from web-based to iOS-based or, or mobile-based uh, applications, right? We've seen this in a lot of industries where the reason why they're successful was because something came along and swept the whole space up and they were there in the right place. And they had enough elasticity in their imagination and the business to be able to jump to that curve or transform that business to take advantage of that trend or that, that moment in time because they were unbiased. They allowed the business to become whatever it was going to become. And so I just want to just highlight this because um, as good as you are, the reason why you can have disproportionate success is because you have an open mind of how you're going to get there. Because these forces actually matter a great deal. Um, in this leadership to get there, you're going to have lots of moments where he has a lot of uh, important economic uh, decisions to make, both on talent, people, funding, projects, decisions. And I just wanted to highlight this because this is something that I think is hard to see in your moments of great stress. And it's just about the, um, the it's not quite decisiveness, but it's about the commitment to your decisions. And so this is just a simple chart to describe this is, you know, we, we have a lot of growth in the beginning and markets change, you know, talent changes, uh, revenues change, customers change. And when they happen, and they happen for the, for the worst in some cases, we have to be able to correct the business. And there's two approaches you can do. One is, um, you know, hey, our customer base is blown up from churn or we target the wrong marketplace and we have to correct the business and I got to let, you know, half my company go to stay alive. I can do have two choices. Uh, one is I can make an incremental decision, which is I can slowly make those cuts or I can eliminate the right or wrong people on the way to that, that outcome. Or I can re-index the business and make that decision once and hard. Once and hard is that hard line there, which is I pick a point in time that I can build back from. I make the hard decision once, which is very uncomfortable. And this could be about people or product decision. But I go deep and hard once, and I let the business arc out of it based on you know, the, all the new assumptions. But if I'd make that decision incrementally, and I get slowly out there, I wait the next you know, month to hang on to that employee, or I w wait to make that decision on the product pivot or that, that feature we may or may not launch, that whole gray area in the middle, that's time or money. And that's the future. And it's also the trust of your employees because that CEO, you, has to be in a position to wear that uncomfortable leadership jacket to make those decisions once. And so as you get deeper and deeper in organizations, you try to unpack this and further, that the operating system that you guys are building has to have evidence of this around patience and, and, and elasticity of, of what the business needs to become, but also making these decisions and be able to understand the impact of them as you go deeper. So 
These were things that became true as we were doing the, doing the interviews, these skills, those are sort of the kind of, the kind of crass ones. But there's two more that I want to share with you that as you go deeper and deeper into the soul of the companies that made a big difference. And there are these two reasons. So these are, you know, they say that, uh, you know, genius is the ability to hold kind of two opposing ideas in your mind at the same time and still have, you know, have a, you know, kind of a rational, uh, be able to make decisions and sort of rationally look through both of them. And it's a good example of that. So you have to balance these two skills in your job as the founder and CEO. So on the one hand, you need to have extreme accountability. And this story is a true story um, that uh, when Steve Jobs was alive a decade ago, he was in his conference room and there was, a, there was a garbage can full of garbage. And he goes and finds the janitor and he's pissed off because you know, he's uh, you know, a neat freak, brings the janitor back and he says, you know, why is there garbage in my conference room? And the janitor says, well, Steve, we, you changed the locks. Like, you know, we're, you know, we care about security and, and privacy, and it's, uh, so I couldn't get in. And Steve thinks about this, and he says, okay, that's a good reason. Don't let it happen again. So at Apple, I, there's about 75,000 employees. These are, these are very simple numbers, but about 15 to 17,000 actually work in the corporation in, that, in the big uh, UFO building that just put a picture up yesterday on. About 55,000 are in retail, but at the company, there's about 75 VPs, roughly. So it's like harder to become like a, generally, uh, you know, a VP than is a generally army. It's like, it's just so difficult to get that position. And very often you'll see, you know, the CTO of, Ado or of, of, of uh, Adobe just joined as a VP of Apple. So big deal. So when he became a VP, he, Steve would bring you to his conference room and tell you the story of the janitor. And then he would tell you this. He'd say, somewhere between the janitor and me, the CEO, reasons don't fucking matter. And they don't. They don't. So let that sink in, because I think this is something that takes a long time in your CEO job to totally accept, is that, is that buck stops here, well, is it, that accountability gets closer and closer into you. It's human nature to look around, right? It's, a, it's the marketing problem, it's the product execution, whatever it is. The truth is, it doesn't matter. And, it, and if you've been through a crisis with a, even a, the best VCs in the world, their psyche is, is very much similar to that. It's your job to have those outcomes. And while there might be sympathy on the other side of it, there's none in the room. And I think this is a very important thing. It might be a extreme view of things, but this is the psyche that gets you into great decision making and is a culture that has a sense of ownership that's so deep that it's almost, an, it's almost a, a perfect view of accountability. And to be truthful, it's actually unrealistic. And so you need a counterweight to this. And so we have to have a reason don't matter culture that is incredible sense of trust, ownership, and uh, collective accountability that we we just, it just happens, you know, whatever it takes, within the set of laws and not harming our brand. And the last, this other rule is, uh, it's about permission. And this is a rule I've created my last two companies. It's called the seven to one rule. And it's a ratio of good to bad. The point is that we have to be able to do extraordinarily more good than we do bad to stay in our companies in that ratio, which is completely impossible and unrealistic. But the point is that we have to recognize that people, product, and data, we're not perfect. We're gonna fail each other, right? Things are gonna break. And we have to be able to go into that brokenness when we become less broken as a company and address it with directness to each other, with truth to each other, and not have the company or the person fall apart or be defensive or blame. The point is that we have to be able to get through those moments because we need wind at our back and the way to do that is because we have to you know, eradicate contempt. We have to be able to basically forgive people up front knowing this so they have the permission to take risk and fail knowing that they have forgiveness so they can move forward when it happens. And it gives us the right to go address it very directly and solve these problems. And it's just a, it's an impossible ratio, just like the reasons don't matter is impossible, but those accountability and the forgiveness, that permission to fail, and permission to be direct and truthful, allow the companies to have wind at their back. And you need this because it takes such an extraordinary amount of good fortune. You know, Tony's question about how lucky are you? It turns out luck is something you can create and influence. You gotta have an incredible karma to make these things happen. So I use this as a, as, a, as a closing slide because you build this as the CEOs. You have the reasons don't matter accountability and you create the culture around contemporary organizations that deal with failure in a way that you can solve it and have people move forward without falling apart. And those things have to be able to be, you know, tensile strengths in the business, in the business to get it to pass through those lenses.
So I'll close with that. If there are any questions, happy to answer them. But you know, I, I you know, have had uh, a little bit of success and, and quite a bit of failure along the way, and continue to learn. I mean, you have you're, 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 you're a lot of uh, you're you're very lucky to have sort of the Brad Pitts of uh, of the startup world in the room, like Tony and Dave and others. I'm sort of on my Steve Buscemi career here, but you know, these things, uh, you know, the, the the answers are out there. They're just not in you. So. That's really the difference. There's what we know, we don't know, and how fast can we get the answers. And our job is to go get them very quickly and learn and accelerate uh, the possibility of our businesses. So thank you.